Welcome to today's webinar, Automating Risk Monitoring and Assessment, Reducing Time and Effort of Manual Processes. I'm thrilled to have you all here. This session is tailored specifically for food and beverage businesses that are frustrated by outdated or manual processes for managing food safety risks. If you're relying on spreadsheets or time-intensive manual steps to keep up with food safety incidents, supplier risks, or ingredient hazards, you will find this webinar especially valuable. We'll dive into modern approaches to help you save time, reduce errors, and ultimately safeguard your brand. In today's globalized landscape, food safety threats are ever-evolving, are ever with incidents making headlines regularly. Staying on high alert for recalls, border rejections, food fraud, and contamination is critical for protecting public health as well as your brand. However, many food businesses, especially those with limited resources, struggle to monitor these risks as effectively as larger organizations. Relying on outdated manual processes like spreadsheets and scattered sources of information can leave companies vulnerable to food safety incidents, costly recalls, reputational damage, and lost sales. In this session, we will explore how food and beverage companies can strengthen their risk monitoring and assessment processes through automation and AI. Moving from annual tracking to a unified AI-powered system allows businesses to reduce the time and effort needed to identify risks, while significantly enhancing the accuracy and responsiveness of their risk intelligence. We will cover practical strategies for automating these processes and give you the tools you need to adopt a future-focused, proactive approach to food safety management. Thank you again for joining us today and let's start it. The focus of today's webinar the key challenges for food and beverage companies that face when monitoring thousands of ingredients and potential risks. Real-world use cases, we will explore practical examples of how food and beverage manufacturers can automate risk assessment for ingredients and suppliers while saving time and increasing accuracy. We will learn how to shift from reactive approaches to predictive risk mitigation strategies using AI to foresee risks before they impact your business. And finally, we will have a live Q&A session. You can bring your questions and our experts will try and answer them. Uh, we have already a chat here available for you, so feel free to drop your questions at any point. I'm Marina Bivsa, I'm the Head of Customer Success at Agrono. I'll be your facilitator for today's session. With my background in supporting food safety solutions, I'm here to guide you through our agenda, helping you understand how these innovative tools can enable food businesses to proactively manage risks and maintain high safety standards. We have Robert Bauer here, Senior Director of Food Safety and Sanitation Nostraus Group, a respected leader in the field of food safety, who will bring deep expertise in food safety and sanitation practices within the food industry. He will share valuable insights on how companies can harness advanced risk monitoring and assessment tools to strengthen food safety protocols, improve operational efficiencies, and meet both regulatory and industry standards. And Michalis Papakostadinou, our data team lead at Agrono, an expert in data-driven food safety solutions, will be our tech specialist today, presenting real-world use cases. Michalis will showcase how advanced data analytics and AI can empower food businesses to proactively monitor risks, streamline their safety processes, and make data-backed decisions that enhance supply chain resilience. A word from our speakers. Uh, what do you expect from this panel, Rob, today? Hello, hello. How are you guys doing? <laughs> so first, I want to thank you for inviting me to this panel. I'm excited. I can't wait to talk about it. Looks like a lot of exciting stuff in here. So uh, what am I expecting from this panel? Uh, probably the same thing a lot of people are expecting, right? When they click on these webinars, it's kind of what's in it for me or how is it going to make my day better, right? Um, you know, today uh, or in today's world, we're all overworked. We have so many things going on and we want to find ways of reducing our workload. One of the best things to do is to find those sort of non-value added activities and get rid of them, 
right? So I'm hoping that we're going to see a little bit of that today, especially for uh, folks on the sites, right? Like, so the site uh, quality managers that are, are managing their raw materials, right? Uh, folks doing audits, procurement uh, folks that are looking to buy uh, uh, ingredients. They want to know what those hazards are and kind of uh, don't waste their time on, on suppliers that are, are too rough. And, and leadership, I'll say, as well. Um, I mean, today they're kind of more interested and curious what the food hazards are. They want to make sure they're steering the business in the right direction. So they also have a stake in this. Um, in terms of manual, right? So we're talking about uh, manual processes. You know, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I've worked uh, all over the world. So I worked in Canada, US, across Europe, and, and the Middle East a little bit here. And I've seen many, many sites. And one thing that a lot of them have in common are these spreadsheets and databases that they manage. There are so many hours and hours and hours of work that go into these and to maintain them. And, you know, the folks there, they jealously guard these spreadsheets. They don't let anyone near them because uh, they're afraid of what's going to happen to the data, right? And, uh, you know, having an automated system or, or, or sort of real-time continuous monitoring is, is, is a big advantage for them. I also saw that we're going to have use cases. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited. Personally, I love use cases. I like to see what other people are doing. So Michaelis, I'm, I, I'm watching. I can't wait to see what you have. I can't wait to see them. Uh, and I think, you know, we can dive in, I hope. Perfect. Thank you so much, Robert. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Michaelis? And hopefully, Robert, you will find interesting what we're about to talk, uh, but also for the audience as well. So what I would say, I would expect by the end of this webinar, since we do actually have actual use cases where, the util where we will utilize data to make ingredient or product recipe risk assessment, supply risk assessment, as well as enhance our has plans uh, by using predictive analytics, I hope that by the end of this webinar, we will have presented these use cases and the audience will have found interesting the data power one can enforce in this kind of decision making. And hopefully by the end of this day, the manual labor and getting rid of Excel spreadsheets, as you said, Robert, will something that may pop into someone's mind. Thank you. Thank you so much both. Let's move on to the challenges. The modern food and beverage industry operates with an increasingly challenging landscape. As global supply chain expands, food safety and quality teams face the complex task of monitoring and managing risks across a vast area of products and suppliers. Many companies still rely on outdated manual processes, leaving them vulnerable to safety incidents and regulatory pressures. With the frequency of recalls, the constant emergence of new threats, and heightened regulatory expectations, the need for robust proactive strategies has never been greater. To protect your brands and ensure consumer safety, you as manufacturers must embrace advanced automated approaches to food safety and risk assessment. Here we have the registration survey results that we ran. Let's take a look at some insights that we gather from our webinar participants who share their primary needs and challenges when it comes to monitoring and assessing risks, risks in food safety. Interestingly, the top need mentioned by more than 50% of the participants highlight a critical focus on continuously monitoring food safety compliance across all suppliers and staying informed about the external risks and hazards that could impact their supply chain. This shows a clear demand for stronger risk assessment methods and more efficient access to real data to manage potential threats effectively. Challenges in prioritizing these needs, unpredictable risks, many participants express concern over unexpected emerging risks they have not encountered before, especially those arising from global supply chain disruptions and new sourcing regions. These unforeseen challenges increase the difficulty of maintaining productive risk management. The lack of comprehensive visibility. A significant challenge is the lack of a holistic, dependable view of all external risks and hazards affecting supply chains, including those posed by collaborative suppliers. 
Without this visibility, managing risks becomes reactive rather than preventative, heightening vulnerability to potential disruptions. Finally, outdated manual processes. Frustration was voiced regarding reliable and outdated manual methods, such as spreadsheets, for critical risk intelligence tasks. This approach not only shows, slows down the decision-making process, but also leaves room for human error, making it hard to adapt to rapidly changing risk landscapes. These responses underscore the urgent need for modernized streamlined systems that provide a reliable, real-time view into supply chain risks, allowing food safety teams to, anticip to anticipate and mitigate threats most effectively. Rob, your reflections on the challenges, I'm sure these are things you have encountered multiple times in the past and in oh, the present. For sure, every one of them, there's no doubt. And, and you know, continuously monitoring um, the risks uh, being on top of the list, that makes perfect sense. And I think, you know, in today's world, right, like you said, uh, there's a global supply chain. Uh, you know, you're buying ingredients from all over the world, different regions. Uh, uh, and some of those regions are shifting. You know, we have climate change and you can't grow things in one place. So you have to grow it somewhere else. Or maybe there's some risks that you weren't considering before because the season's a little wetter and you have more mycotoxins and other things growing. So, you know, it really puts pressure on food safety people to 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 need to monitor continuously because we can't just do a one and done. We have to be on top of, of all that information. And like you said, that's, that's a movement from being reactive to proactive, right? And that's, that's important for everyone. Now, for those people who are operating under FISMA, right? The onus is on them, uh, you know, with the, the supply chain PC uh, to be knowledgeable of those hazards, right? So, the, the FDA is not expecting uh, the suppliers to do it as much as the manufacturers. So the manufacturers have to be well aware of all the hazards themselves and monitor and manage them internally if they can't get their suppliers to do it, right? Um, probably one of the more interesting things uh, this year, the FDA uh, changed, they updated their Appendix 1. So many people depended on Appendix 1 and it lists out all the biological, chemical, and physical hazards, right? So what they've done is they have actually kind of removed the physical hazards. They've uh, said, well, you know what? Process controls, if you're a manufacturing plant, you own them. You need to understand. So if you're buying sugar and you don't make sugar, uh, you still need to know uh, all those risks, process control risks that could could happen in that industry. You might not be wise to them. So it's a bit tough if they remove that and you don't have a, a reference. So mm -hmm. something like Fudakai, um, I anticipate, right, that you can look up those hazards. You'll see the likelihood. You'll see the occurrences. And you go, you know what? These are physical things that I need to worry about and include in my, my HACCP plan. So uh, with all those things, I can I can understand why people feel that kind of pressure. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robert. Michal, yeah. any reflections on the results? Well, actually, it's, these are very, very interesting results. I believe from the food industry perspective, Rob has already covered this aspect very, very well. And uh, what's interesting to me is that, indeed, all of these challenges mentioned here are challenges that can be solved with the data available within Foodagai, but pretty much any system that collects and analyzes similar kind of data, they could tackle using this data, they can tackle these kind of needs. And hopefully the three use cases we're about to see will also provide some answers as to how data, food safety related data can be used to answer these questions. Thank you and let's move on to the use cases. Perfect. Thank you very much, Marina. So what we have prepared for today's webinar are actually three use cases. All are around risk assessment and identification, but from different aspects. On the first use case, we will focus on ingredient risk assessment as well as product recipe risk assessment, so as to provide a group of ingredients and analyze the hazards, the available food safety related data for this kind of ingredients or product recipes. Then we will move on to the supplier risk assessment part. And by suppliers, we mean food companies involved in the supply chain of a specific uh, industry. And finally, on our third use case, we will cover the emerging, very, very new or increasing hazards 
as far as risk identification goes. So if we can move on to the next slide, let's start with the actual use case. As mentioned in the introductory part, all of the use cases we're about to see are actually real world use cases. These are cases from user company, companies that are using our product. And for the first one, as we said, we will focus on the ingredient and product recipe risk assessment. Now, the specific industry use case we have isolated here has a very, very specific pain point. How can one analyze all of the available data concerning food safety in order to anticipate what is the risk assessment for a specific ingredient or a specific geographic region and or specific suppliers? In these use cases, we're focusing on a manufacturer that's actually quite big, but I guess this is no surprise for our audience. We're talking about more than a thousand ingredients and products that they are dealing with, more than 800 suppliers, food companies, they are uh, getting their products or they are shipping their products too. And of course, in terms of locations, they are spread all around the world. Now, the solution we're about to present, uh, of course, using our tool, Fudakai, will be focused on the analysis of food safety related data in order to perform this risk assessment. Keep in mind that all of the slides we're about to see, by the way, are actual screenshots from our system. And for any data analytics related slide, more than 1 million food safety data records have been taken into account. Now we can move on to the next slide and dive into the actual use case. So let's assume uh, we're dealing with milk. How can we utilize these multiple data records that exist in order to identify, to perform a hazard analysis report for this ingredient? On the screenshot on the right, what you see is a, a top level hazard analysis specifically for the ingredient of milk. In this hazard analysis, we're analyzing more than 1.6 thousand data records involving close to 500 different suppliers, different food companies. More than 300 hazards have been taken into account and of course, these uh, food recalls and border issues and food safety related data were analyzing originating, originated from a bit above 90 different countries. So using this top level analysis, one, based on the occurrence of data, can identify which are the regions around the world where, where milk is produced that is most likely to be recalled or affected by a border rejection. In the coloring scheme here, needless to say that darker red means more data, lighter red means less. This is one side of the story. So in this way, one can identify whether the regions they are sourcing their milk from is, is a region that's usually affected by food recalls and border rejections. And then, similarly to what uh, Rob also mentioned in the introductory part, one can dive into the actual data and identify which are the kinds of hazards, the hazard categories involved in these recalls and border rejections. So, Analyzing these 1.6 thousand data records, how many of them have to do with some kind of fraud hazard or biological hazard or chemical hazard and so on. Interestingly enough, using this data, by the way, it seems that one out of five uh, food incidents concerning milk had to do with the presence of some kind of biological hazard. Moving on to, to the next slide. Now, of course, we're talking about multiple data records that are used in this kind of analysis. And needless to say that there most probably is no human being alive that can easily analyze 1.6 thousand data records. This is where computers are good at. But even so, in this top level analytics, no one will actually go through all of the records to identify which may affect, which cases may affect them, which hazards may affect them. This is why in these screenshots we are seeing here, let's focus on the one on the left uh, first, we are highlighting in the dashboard functionalities of Fudakai, out of all of the hazards that have taken place, all of the reasons behind recalls for milk throughout the years, which are the hazards, reasons behind recall, that are either new or that are increasing. And by new, we mean hazards that have taken place over the past years for the first time, as opposed to the roughly 40 we have data on. And by increasing, we mean the hazards, the reasons behind recall that are showing an out of the ordinary behavior in terms of tendency. Interesting thing here, and this is something I believe that uh, the food industry is very much focused on over the past years, is we see some PFAS here identified as new hazards. This is why we have added these screenshots as well. The industry may be talking about it, but in this, this kind of data anal analysis, 
these hazards are identified as new and highlighted in the dashboard functionalities of a system such as Fudakai. And now the interesting thing as well is that we're talking about data analysis and one can be as in depth as they want concerning the data analysis. On the screenshot of the right, we isolated one of these cases for a specific uh, PFAS hazard and are presenting there uh, the ability to dive into the data, identify specific data records that may affect your own supply chain, potentially also mentioning food company suppliers involved in that, so you can quickly check whether this is a data record that's relevant to you and obviously update your audit plans accordingly. If we move on to the next slide, now, we talked initially in this use case around ingredient risk assessment and product recipe risk assessment. This is something very interesting that the system having the data that Futakai does can do. So when we're talking about product recipe, and let's focus on the screens on the lower left side, we're talking about basically a group of ingredients added together in order to produce a specific product brand. In this example here, we have created the sesame bar that contains sesame, almonds, and honey, but this is just a very naive um, product recipe, of course, one can be as detailed as I want. Having this in hand, we can utilize the food safety-related data records we have at our disposal and perform a risk assessment throughout this product recipe. This is depicted on the screenshot on top that says that for this sesame bar, for this specific product recipe, and using the data at our disposal, we believe that your session bar, this specific product recipe, has a medium risk, scoring now 9 out of 15 using the formula we have incorporated, but of course, the actual formula can be, can be updated. And not only that, if we focus on the screenshot on the lo lower right side, we can also dive into the actual risk assessment data. So out of all of the ingredients we have added into our product recipe, if we focus on one, in this example, we have highlighted the sesame the sesame ingredient, which are the hazards that more usually that have the highest risk assessment for sesame. Of course, salmonella is present there, no surprises, but there are also some other things such as heavy metals and pesticide values that may be missing for, from one solid plan and could be incorporated. And moving on to the next slide, we try to dive in deeper into this kind of data. So, so far we created the product recipe with some top level analysis identified the riskiest ingredient and the respective hazards associated with that. But you can also perform a similar kind of analysis, but from another point of view. Which are the new hazards? Screenshot on the left side. By new, we mean hazards that have taken place for the first time in the period of analysis we're using for risk assessment, as opposed to the roughly 40 years we have data on. And interestingly enough, we are seeing here, for instance, the presence of heavy metals in sesame, such as lead. This, this kind of highlight and the fact that it's categorized as new means that it may be missing from one plant or it's something that's an outlier, something very, very new in the industry that could potentially affect one supply chain. This is one part. And under the top five risk, the screenshot on the right, out of all of the hazards that have taken place for any ingredient added in our product recipe, which are the hazards that have the highest risk assessment value that in return we should focus on. In the case of sesame, of the sesame bar, sesame scores highest, specifically salmonella and the specific active substance of pesticides is highlighted here. Moving on to the next slide now. What we've seen so far concerning this use case has to do with the data analysis of historical data. There is no uncertainty there. All of these data records have taken place at least once. So there is no uncertainty that this is something that at least once has affected the food industry. Let's now attempt to utilize this historical data in order to, to go 12 months into the future to perform a predictive analytics for specifically using forecasting methods in order to attempt to predict what will take place for a specific ingredient. In this case, we have highlighted honey. So what do we believe, what do our most accurate models believe will take place on a monthly basis over the next 12 months, the screenshot on the left side, what is, the risk asset, what is the riskiest expected hazard for this ingredient? Top right screenshot. In the case of honey, our most accurate forecasting models believe that economically motivated adulteration will be the prevalent hazard over the next 12 months for honey. And you can study the actual tendency. 
and the screens on the lower right, since we talked about product recipes, and assuming one has added multiple into a system such as Fudakai, which are the product recipes existent in one account that may be affected by this prevalent hazard and what's the respective risk assessment value. Now, concluding this use case, why did we did the analysis and screenshots that we do? As we said, this is an actual use case, something that has already been incorporated by actually multiple uh, users of our system. And why do we do that? First of all, we're talking about the analysis of multiple data records. The goal there is to save the manual efforts, the manual labor involved in collecting this data, analyzing this data. This is something that's done out of the box. Obviously, by reducing manual effort, we're reducing uh, time spent in these activities. So this is, again, um, another win, I'd say, for someone using this data-driven decision-making. Apart from that, being able to identify new and or emerging hazards that have happened at least once is also something that's of added value uh, in this example use case we're seeing. And finally, since we touched on the predictive analytics part, being able to identify using these forecasting um, approaches what most likely will take place over the next 12 months is something that's moving from a reactive to a proactive approach. And enough about me talking. Rob, what do you think? Uh, well, I'll say wow, 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 right? I mean, I really like uh, uh, that use case. I mean, I can almost see all the folks in the site level, right? Uh, getting ready to put all their recipes in against against all their, their various products and, and that. But, you know, that's, that's also a lot of work, right? And I guess, uh, Michaelis, I'm gonna ask you a question. I mean, is this a lot of work? I mean, how much work are we talking about here? Uh, Cause like, look, there's a thousand ingredients, 800 suppliers. I have 10, 12 different lines, who knows how many products each. It sounds like a, a lot of work at the beginning, at least. Indeed. And that is true, Rob. And as a matter of fact, this is a kind of problem that's very much a computer science problem. So we're talking about okay. a thousand ingredient or 800 suppliers. The important thing in order for a system such as Fudakai to easily, for one, using such system to easily take advantage of the functionalities there would be to align the terminology used between how we're talking in grid, we're um, describing ingredients internally in a company to how Fudakai, for instance, or whatever else terminology we're using, how they describe the ingredients. Once this okay. is done, and this is, by the way, something that can be easily automated by a computer science approach, then the actual integration and the actual addition is very straightforward. So the difficult part is aligning the terminology between the two parties. Ah, that makes sense. So, so yeah, so consolidating those ingredients so you're not having three different types of sugars you're looking for and all that is sugar, sugar, if that's the, the, the category we're in. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it probably makes it a little bit easier with ongoing maintenance, right? Because we're always growing and building and creating new stuff. And, you know, someone's got to go in there and, and, and do this work, right? But, you know, I think one, one of the things I think is, is, is going to be interesting, right, uh, for a site like this, is you, you know, you, you, it almost goes beyond suppliers, right? So you may have a supplier, but now you're looking at the group, right? You're looking at the category of ingredients and what the risks are. And so it'll tell you that there's a potential hazard. And, and going back to our, our fictitious plant, right, where we have, you know, 14 different lines and we have multiple products on each and maybe, you know, each one of them has honey in it, right? Or, or, or some other ingredient. I tell you, if there's a hazard that comes up in there, that thing's going to light up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> and you know what? This guy's going on holiday. I don't think I want to be anywhere near it. I'll be honest with you. But uh, I think I'll leave it at that. You know, I, But I do think that there's a lot of value. I can see people getting ready to just put all the ingredients in there. But like you said, if you calm down, think about it rationally so you can manage and maintain it, uh, it's the only way to go. I, I, it just occurred to me that this could be very difficult on that end, but it sounds like you guys have a plan. Indeed, and that's an excellent point, Rob. Under no circumstances is it our goal to stop one from having vacation period, but from another way around, actually, if you rely on this kind of data to, to assist you in the decision-making approach, then my guess is that you can go on vacation and be 
feel at least safer that you have tackled almost everything that at least has happened at least once. And now, Rob, you mentioned a couple of times the, the supplier part in your reflection. This is actually where we will focus for the second use case. What we see in the first one, ingredient the product recipe. Let's now focus on the supplier level. Let's assume we are talking about a company that has multiple suppliers, multiple food companies they are working with. In this specific use case, we have identified a specific company that deals with more than a thousand different suppliers, obviously spread all around the world. Some are small, some are bigger. And the main pain point, again, is around the data analysis and identification of hazards, problems, risks that may affect the specific suppliers, the specific food companies one is working with. In a similar approach as we did for the previous use case, we will try to utilize the data at our disposal in order to assist in this decision making, identifying again which are the cases one should be on the lookout for, which are the potential emerging hazards, and obviously being able to inform the for a company to be able to inform their suppliers accordingly. If we move on to the next slide, let's start diving into uh, this part of the analysis. Now, Rob, you mentioned in your reflection for concerning the first use case that the actual import into a system such as Fudakai can be a lengthy process. And we talked about the importance of aligning the terminology between one another, and then the, the approach is actually very straightforward. Indeed, the addition of one's supplier into a system such as a food guy is something very important. Of course, technology can assist in that. And what we're seeing in this specific use case is an existent customization step where a company has added all of the companies they want to keep track of. This is highlighted on the left red block there, as well as the ingredients that specifically they are sourcing from these companies. So as to make a more detailed, a more detailed risk assessment approach. If we move on to the next slide, one using the data available uh, throughout the world concerning suppliers and food safety in general, one can perform, can study the dynamic supplier profile of a specific food company. We're talking about dynamic here, and uh, this is something quite interesting because as you can understand, uh, as each day goes by, there are new announcements, food safety related announcements made around the world some announcement in India, another one in the US, another one in Mexico, being able to aggregate all of this information under one instance, one entity, such as the supplier A in this case, is something very important. But this part from a technology and data point of view is not that straightforward because uh, as I'm sure the audience is very much aware of, suppliers basically are food companies and food companies have a specific hierarchy behind it. They may have subsidiaries, they may have parent organizations, they may have multiple plants around the world. So one very important data work for someone to be able to generate such a supplier profile aggregating all of the information is first aggregating the information concerning the structure of this specific company, which are the suppliers, which are the subsidiaries, parent organizations, alternative names, and so on. Having done that, then one can make the most out of the data coming from food recalls and border rejections in order to prioritize their own internal loaded plans for suppliers based on the data available. And this is what we are seeing here in the screenshot on the right. Moving on to the next slide. Now, obviously, we all love report reports and report making. Pretty much, I'm guessing everyone in the audience as well has, has used some kind of business intelligence tools such as Tableau or Power BI or MyTabase or whatever it is. Indeed, this is something very important to the industry. And obviously, one can make use of a system such as Fudakai to generate their own internal reports, either on an ingredient level or on a supplier level. So imagine utilizing the roughly million data records we have on food safety and creating a report specifically for out of all of this data, which are the ones that are affecting at least one of your suppliers. And obviously then you can dive into the actual data, such as the one that we seen in the first use case, prioritize the hazard categories based on, the, on their occurrence for your suppliers, and of course, prioritize the audit plans for your suppliers specifically as well. Moving on to the next slide. Now, 
what we've talked so far has to do with the data, the publicly available data concerning suppliers. Food recalls, border rejections, inspections, warning letters, and so on. These are all publicly available data. And one can have them in a dashboard such as the one um, depicted here. The interesting thing, and I'm pretty sure that, Rob, you know this way better than I do, is that food companies are actually doing their own audits, their own risk assessment scoring as far as suppliers go. So imagine now, and this is something feasible using a system such as Foodakai, combining the two different data sets of information. So what does the outside world uh, say about a specific supplier, a specific food company, but there is also a wealth of information present in the premises inside the company. Imagine then combining the two different data sets in order to be able to produce the final supplier risk assessment score. And this is what we depict in this screenshot. Highlighted in blue are the external data. Highlighted in green are the internal data. Their combination in the final column on the right produces the overall risk assessment score for a specific supplier. And now, moving on to the next slide. Now, again, why did we do what we just described? First up is to make sure that given the wealth of data available throughout the world for food companies, one has to be certain that they have taken into account all of these data records. This is something that, of course, cannot happen uh, manually, but there needs to be an automatic tool that aggregates this information. And then it's up to the user, up to the food company, to make sure that they are using this kind of data to update their plans or mitigate uh, or mitigation actions as well. And of course, this assists to this actual uh, design of this audit plan. And finally, this is a, a business value that's shared throughout these use cases. Obviously, time reduction and cost saving from these prioritized uh, audit plans that may lead to less recalls and border rejections is something that's again of value. And again, Rob, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I, and look, it makes sense, right? Uh, there's only so many audits you can do a year, right? And you have to get the best bang for your buck. So you want to make sure that you're you're picking the right suppliers, the ones that you're most worried about, whether it's business sensitive or whether there's a high risk involved. Um, now, when people are assessing, assessing and kind of doing that risk, of course, they like to play with the margins, right? So they might weigh one uh, versus the other and maybe make something like a, a recall very high, but then your own audit might be high, but yeah, if they had an inspection, well, well who cares, you know? So, uh, you know, there, there has to be a weighting system. And, I, and I'm sure that Fudokai has a way of, of weighting all these things. So we're not just relying on your scores, right? Indeed, Rob, it's almost like you know how parts of Fudakai works. But oh, indeed, well. there is a weighted approach involved in this uh, supplier risk assessment. And basically, at least our rationale when designing this formula was that we wanted to present to the user the ability to be able to simulate their own way of performing risk assessment using our data as well. But of course, yeah, your, data, your internal data is obviously super, super useful. Yeah, yeah. and that makes sense, you know, because everyone, everyone wants to do it the way they do it. You know, I think that we can't have a system take over and tell us how it's going to be. We have to kind of stick to our values and how we, we balance these things. Now, I'm going to give you one more business value uh, that you need on that slide, uh, and it'll be a nod out to all the procurement type folk out there. Um, when, when you have audits um, uh, of a supplier and they're performing well, you know, they're performing well, when they're kind of uh, medium or, or even poor performing, that doesn't stop them every year from coming to you and going for a price increase. And I tell you, procurement people really need to have this kind of data saying, look, you're underperforming in these regions. You're 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 a lower risk. You're a higher risk for us. Here are the hazards we see in your industry or in your product. And you know, uh, you know, you want a price increase. You want us to pay you more, right, for a product that could be poor quality. So you know, just just a uh, a gift. I would add that on your on your business value. Okay. 
amazing, amazing input, <laughs> Rob. Hopefully our business development team is present in this webinar and they kept a note of your suggestion. This will update our strategy, my guesses. But excellent, excellent <laughs> point. And now, let's go to the third use case. Now, we talked about ingredient and product recipe risk assessment. We talked about supply risk assessment. Let's try to anticipate new increasing or out of the ordinary hazards. This is what the third use case is focused on, on the identification of emerging and increasing risks. Again, we're talking about an actual use case and other big manufacturers present in this use case, multiple ingredients, multiple suppliers, multiple locations around the world. And now, again, the pain point, the reason we did this kind of analysis is because these people, this, comp this food company, was unsure about whether they were including everything in their own um, audit has plan in this case. And again, the, our answer to that, sat similarly to the previous use case we saw, is a data-driven uh, decision-making as far as this food safety approach goes. If we can move on to the next slide, let's try to dive into this. So using a system such as Foodagai, one can receive email alerts. Everyone loves their email alerts, these newsletters, they come in the updates tab of your Gmail, you never read them, or hopefully you do read them. And if you do, there are some highlights, data highlights one can identify. This is what's highlighted in the red block on the screenshot on the right. So assuming one has created a product recipe and or added their ingredients in Fudakai, the system can automatically perform this risk assessment approach that we talked about in the previous use cases and identify outliers in terms of the risk assessment output. In this case, we have created in our account the Spice Mix that specifically for the hazards of mineral oil this and these other two pesticides, the risk assessment, the tendency of the risk assessment score is very, very high. Specifically, let's focus now on mineral, on mineral oil more than 13,000 percentage increase is within mineral oil in this spice mix we have created. Keep in mind that this is based on actual data. There is no uncertainty in the calculations, but these are early, early indicators that something super out of the ordinary has happened. So this is a highlight that one should take into account uh, when drafting the audit plans or prioritizing the work. Moving on to the next slide. Now, this is not the only kind of top-level highlights one can get out of uh, such data. Another kind of email one receives from systems such as our own is what we call a uh, weekly insights trend. And we have highlighted here two interesting examples, at least in our mind, uh, in this email. On the screen on the left, out of all of the cases, all of the food recalls and border rejections that have happened throughout the past week, which are the trending hazards? Which are the hazards that seem to be on the rise? In this case, listeria and some allergens and salmonella is present there. Small data note here, a, a system such as Fudekai, on average, we receive more than two to 5,000 different data records on a weekly basis. So keep in mind that this kind of analysis is the output of this collection. This is as far as the screenshot of the left goes. And now if we focus on the screenshot of the right, that's titled Imaging Hazards for Your Ingredients. In this block, we are highlighting for every ingredient added into a data system, such as Fudakai, which are the hazards that are emerging, meaning that are very, very new. We have highlighted in the red block here some specific pesticides within herbs and spices, because interestingly enough, it was actually an interest of interest to us as well when we were preparing these slides, because we actually clicked on them and we saw that the actual data records are very, very new. So these are pesticides that happened um, very, very recently for herbs and spices from an incident perspective. However, from a regulation perspective, these pesticides are regulated at least within the EU since 2005. And this is something very, very interesting. More than almost 20 years later, uh, these were actually recalled. And if we move on to the next slide, uh, Magna, now, We've seen the top level analysis, top level highlights from an email alert perspective. Let's try to dive into the data. Having add, uh, if one adds all of the ingredients into a system 
and it says as food guy, and let's focus now on the block on the left, out of all of these ingredients, which are the ones that are showing an increasing tendency? Which are the ingredients in your supply chain that are on the rise? We're isolating them here. By the way, small note is that by tendency, we're comparing the past 12 months of data with the 12 months before. This is one side of the story. We're highlighting cheese here because we then attempted to dive in deeper into the data, screenshot on the right, and study the yearly distribution of uh, food recalls and border rejections for cheese throughout the past 10 years. We say this that it's kind of an interesting analysis because apart from the obvious that over the past four years we are so we are seeing a sharply increasing tendency. So as the years progress from 2020 to 2024, we're seeing a steadily increase of food recalls and border rejections for cheese. Interestingly enough, though, within 2024, we are experiencing the highest possible peak as far as food recalls and border rejections go for cheese. And obviously, needless to say, keep in mind that 2024 is not yet done. So this is something that's out of the ordinary and we would say quite interesting, at least from a data perspective. So some kind of highlights, something is happening in cheese throughout the past four years. And now, if we move on to the next slide, obviously, one can dive in deeper into this kind of data. We also touched parts of this screenshot in our first use case. So out of all of the data, all of the food recalls and border rejections for cheese throughout the years, which are the hazards that are most likely to happen? Almost 2,000 uh, recalls and border rejections for cheese have to do with the presence of Listeria monostogenes, but there are some others around, the Serichia coli, poor hygienic state, mulch, and other organolytic aspects. The question here is, are we including this kind of hazard into our testing plans? And if not, should we, perhaps? This is the part on the left. And obviously, similarly to the to use case one, we can perform a, a region-oriented um, analysis and identify out of all of the countries that are producing cheese, which are the ones that are having most of the recalls or border rejections. Are we sourcing from these countries? Is there, is there something specific we should take into account? These are the kind of questions that could be answered by using this kind of data. And now, moving on to the next slide. Again, as we said in the previous use cases, so far what we've seen relies on historical data. Again, let us stress here, there is no uncertainty behind this kind of calculations. Now, however, the question is, can we use this data to move 12 months into the future? In this case, we're highlighting what predictive analytics models can highlight for a product category such as herbs and spices. The analysis is pretty similar to the honey example we were seeing before. So what is expected to take place over the next 12 months? Top right screenshot. Bottom left screenshot, which are the very, very new hazards for herbs and spices, such as the ones highlighted in the email alert. And screenshot uh, bottom right, which are the hazards that our most accurate models believe are, are most likely to increase in the future? And by what percent? In this uh, example and before we go into the value added by this use case. Rob, you mentioned uh, in your initial reflection uh, the point around weather data and possibly their connection to mycotoxin and things like that. Keep in mind that whenever we've seen at least food archive, but my guess is that in similar systems, similar approaches are used. Whenever we're talking about predictive analytics, at least within food archive, more than 1 billion different data records are used. Weather data, by the way, it's one of these data types but by the way, we incorporated it fairly recently and has heavily increased the accuracy of our model. So very nice point, Rob. Now, if we move on to the next slide, uh, let's wrap up with the business value. Again, as we said for the previous two use cases, we are talking about a time reduction in the time spent for manual effort. There is no need for anyone to go through websites around the world, learn, 190 different languages in order to identify which are the hazards that most likely will affect their supply chain, one can use this data solution to get the answers directly out of a system. Obviously, the goal there is to be able to prevent food recalls and border rejections. Needless to say, these kind of things have, apart from the economic damage done to a company, has also, is also doing damage to the brand name of the company. 
And obviously, since we touched on the predictive analytics, we're focusing on the proactive actions that can be taken in order to enhance audit plans and hash plans. And no surprise for you, Rob. You saw this coming. What do you think of this use case? No, look, it goes back um, to needing to mitigate right risks uh, from a global supply chain, right? Um, um, you know, I love the map, right? Uh, I don't know what's happening with France and cheese, but, uh, you know, it's nice to see uh, uh, the map. Everyone loves those kind of things. I like the emails, the automatic uh, alerts, you know. Um, you know, I think it really helps, especially kind of in a central quality role or a corporate quality role uh, where, where we're using these to either predict ourselves or use prediction models to say, well, you know, where do we have gaps in our, our programs? You know, where what's the next thing that we need to write? Maybe we need to have a statement. Um, you, you mentioned mineral oil, right? Um, and it looked really high. So mosh and MOA um, contamination is, is really kind of a big thing right now. And so, you know, companies will be out there writing their procedures or statements and and how they're managing, uh, uh, you know, their, their lubrications or their release uh, oils and everything else they're doing. Um, now, I think you said, you said something like two to five thousand records a week. Is that is that what it was? Something like that. Yep, in total, and, yes. And so, so I guess I do have a question for you. Uh, uh, you know, even five days ago, there's a big cheese recall in America. So maybe the American one will get a little bit more red uh, now. But uh, there's a like five days ago, they had a big recall for for Listeria mono. H- how long does it take to get that into the system? And when would I see something like that? email into me what's your turnaround time excellent point i know on average every five minutes there is a new data record in our system this is the broadest answer so however in order for you to receive an email alert this actually depends on the food safety authority that made the announcement since we're talking about an announcement in the u.s and we're talking about cheese my guess is that we're talking about fda which mm-hmm. on average roughly five minutes after the original announcement, you will see this within Fudakai. And depending on how you have set up your customization, whether it's a daily, instantly, or weekly, you will receive the respective email alert once available. However, this is not the case for every of our data sources. There are data sources, usually these are the ones that are announcing the border rejections, where these announcements, such as the FTA import alerts or the Japanese border rejections, usually there is a latency of roughly one month that they announce the data. So they usually announce, for instance, mid-November for data that have happened up until the end of October. So basically, this depends on the data source. But in gen- on average, every five minutes, you will see a new data record in our system. Okay. So so the turnaround time is, is, is how long for... So like, look, they're in different languages too. You know, I mean, they're French. I assume they're in Greek. Mm-hmm. They're German. Like, I mean, you name it, right? So someone's got to look at that, translate it, and then enter it in your system, right? Mm, so how long does it take uh, to, to, to go from, oh, there's an announcement to, is it two days? Is it, is it a mm. week? Mm, actually, I might have stumped you. No, hmm, that's, a, that's interesting. No, that's actually an interesting question because the five-minute part that we said involves this translation piece. So what we have... In general, as a data approach, we follow a semi-automatic approach for the data announcements that we have. Okay. Every five minutes, we are collecting new data records announced by food safety authorities around the world. So let's assume there is an announcement on FDA. We'll get it a worst case scenario five minutes later than the originally posted it on the website. Then the automatic part kicks in that automatically identifies, a uh, translates everything to English and, that, and attempts to identify the product recalled, the hazard, reason behind the recall, company, date, and so on. After this automatic part is done, then it's time for uh, the food scientists internally in our team to make sure that the machine did a nice work or, and or potentially update the data record. So similarly to the alerts that a user receives in Fudakai, there are similar internal alerts that our food scientists are receiving once we collect a new data record. And then going into the data record, making sure that everything is correct, and then making the data record available in our system. On average, again, I'd say 
five to 15 minutes, you will see a new data record. But again, this depends on the source. But the, the okay. translation part is done automatically, obviously. Okay, okay. So that's good. I mean, I'm glad someone's looking at it because, again, it's the uh, uh, thing, same thing with all data, right? It's kind of garbage mm -hmm. in, garbage out. You can't put in garbage. You have to you have to look at it. You have to assess it, whether it's value added. So, no, thank you very much for that. I think I just learned there. Yeah. And if I may just build on what Rob said, and before we move on to the Q&A part, though, I think we have roughly five minutes to go. This is a very interesting point indeed, Rob, for the garbage in, garbage out, because indeed, if you recall on the use cases we talked about, we're also employing predictive analytics within Fudakai. If there was no data quality in the input data for the predictive analytics, the output out of the box contains some uncertainty. If you put on non-quality data in, the uncertainty is increased. Expands. Yes, of course. Of course, makes perfect sense. Thank you both. Thank you, Michalis, for sharing the use cases. And Rob, of course, for your lovely uh, remarks and uh, reflections. Uh, there were already some questions uh, during the webinar, which is great. Uh, and we've seen some on the chat. I know we only have a couple more minutes, but uh, I would like maybe to try and answer one or two of them, if possible. Uh, I can start the first one I'm seeing here. Uh, how can someone effectively be early informed about all external risks? Uh, someone would like to take that on? Harley, any suggestions? Yeah, I can start, but obviously, uh, Rob, feel free to jump in. Yeah. So, uh, my guess is that this question is actually linked to all of the use cases that we saw. So the first one had to do with the ingredient, the product recipe risk assessment, which takes into account uh, food safety related data to identify which are the hazards most likely that are most likely going to affect you from an ingredient point of view. The second use case had to do with the same kind of analysis, but from a supplier point of view, from the food commerce that you are working with. And the final one has to do with emerging and increasing risks and again, relevant to your supply chain. So longer answer, I just gave it. Quicker answer is rely on the food safety availability of the food safety data that are available. Thank you, Michalis. Rob, anything to add? Yeah, look, if you don't have an automatic system with all these, this data going into a thing, then you know you have to go to a magazine or you have to go, go through the uh, Google or you have to, you know, you have subscriptions, uh, but it's, it's very inefficient, of course, because you're not sitting there watching it and you're not getting fully digested uh, data, right? So uh, platforms that, that do this kind of service, this kind of work is, is, is the only way to really keep on top of global uh, risks. Maybe locally you can do it, but uh, globally that'd be very tough without a system to assist you. Thank you. Thank you so much both. And just to, before we wrap up, uh, if you had to keep one thing, one thing today, only from today's conversation, what would it be? Uh, Michali, would you like to start? Yeah, definitely, Marina. Uh, so if we go back to the introductory slide, my title is a uh, data engineer and team leader of our data team. So if I, if I had to start to keep one thing from today's discussion is that we talked a lot about data, food safety related data, and how they can help in the decision making and everyday lives of people working in the food industry. So in my mind, I think this is, at least for me, the most important thing. Thank you so much. Rob? Yeah, look, uh, the one thing I'll say, um, you know, is as food safety professionals, right? Uh, you know, we tend to, sometimes we might look only at the food safety, but I would encourage people to look outside of that because we're part of a bigger team, right? We're actually part of a business and we're here to produce food and make money and make money for the company too. I mean, it's part of our job. And so so looking at it from a procurement point of view, looking at it from, from an executive point of view and seeing uh, how it benefits the company in more ways than just simply uh, looking at a hazard and a risk. You're doing a lot more uh, for the company than, than just that. And, and we really have to keep our eyes open on, on how much we're really giving to the company. Definitely. Thank you so much both for uh, participating and everyone who was online and attended the webinar today. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Okay.